So, 2020 was a thing. Let's cut to the chase, 2020 wasn't what I would call a good year in general. But thankfully, despite all the bad stuff that happened to us, the games ended up uh, pretty good, actually. It's really amazing that so many developers had to transition to a work-from-home situation and it delivers such great and unique experiences. The same rules still apply. No ports, and some games definitely went through the cracks so I couldn't get to play everything. In particular, I really wish I had time for Yakuza Like a Dragon, but I'm probably gonna play it once it gets to PS5. But the most important disclaimer of this entire video is that in 2020, I got to be a part of a team who made Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time. So because of that, this game is ineligible to be on the list. With all that out of the way, let's delve into my top 10 games of 2020. If imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, then Nintendo should definitely feel flattered by Immortals Phoenix Rising. And yeah, it is definitely a Breath of the Wild copycat, but I consider it more of a loving homage than blatant plagiarism. Unlike the bloated, empty areas that plague most of Ubisoft's titles, the game has a much smaller, dense area with more enjoyable activities. There is absolutely no hand-holding, as players are free to explore their heart's content. Beside designated challenge vaults, which are pretty much the shrines from Breath of the Wild, there are some clever puzzles hidden throughout the open world itself to solve. Not only that puzzle solving is engaging, but so is the combat. Stringing combos with Phoenix's weapons alongside parrying and dodging enemy attacks has a good rhythm to it. It becomes even more extravagant once new abilities are unlocked too. Granted, there are some polish issues. Aiming throwable items can be kind of a pain, and some physics-based puzzles have shoddy execution. This one in particular made me so frustrated I had to look a guide online to see how to solve it, only to figure out I was just doing everything right and I was just being incredibly unlucky. And the humor is definitely subjective, and I know this is weird coming from me, but some of the jokes definitely don't hit. But warts and all, this is a pretty engaging experience that you can just sink in so many hours into. Plus, I have to give it credit for teaching me more about Greek mythology. Even though this is not the last game on the list to feature a game based on Greek mythology. I love the PlayStation 5. Not only that the launch lineup was better than both the PS3 and the PS4, but the hardware upgrades, including the revolutionary DualSense controller, definitely make this a complete package. And if you really need any proof, look no further than Astro's Playroom. This game is the perfect showcase for the capabilities of the PlayStation 5. The non-existent load times, the haptic feedback, the adaptive triggers, and even the motion controls function. The fact that every owner of this amazing console gets this charming platformer for absolutely free is mind-boggling. But quite frankly, the biggest reason why I adore this game so much are all the secrets. Many of the items that can be found harken to the days of the PlayStation lineage, and all the easter eggs that can be found will bound to put a smile on your face, especially if you've been gaming along for the last 25 years or so. Just because this game is a free pack and doesn't make it a tech demo, in fact, this little game has so much more heart than some of the biggest games in the market today. Astro's Playroom is imaginative, fun, delightful, and absolutely worth the price of admission of a PS5, if you can get one. When Sony first unveiled the PlayStation 3 at E3 2005, they showed this tech demo. 
and that is when the hype first began. I wasn't expecting a Final Fantasy VII Remake, I thought this was purely a tech demo. But lo and behold, a decade later, they actually announced the game. So everyone rejoiced, even though they had to wait 5 more years to actually get the game. And the good news? Square treated this with the absolute respect it deserves. Safe to say I was a little bit skeptical when I heard the game only covers the beginning portion of the original game. But thanks to all the flair it has thanks to its production values, I was entertained from beginning to end. The action set pieces are thrilling, the graphics are beautiful, and the soundtrack is great while never being redundant since no track repeats more than a few times. All of the cast is instantly endearing, but especially the Avalanche trio. Biggs, Wedge and Jesse barely got a few lines in the original, and now they're fully fleshed out characters that I want to see more of. The biggest hook for me was the combat system. Square finally managed to handle real-time combat and weave it in with classic turn-based conventions. Took me a while to figure it out, I admit, but once I realized that linking materia can actually shift the tide of battle, I was instantly hooked. This system is incredibly fun. As much as I want to rank this game higher, the story definitely feels padded to say the least. Chapters could have been shortened or cut outright to deliver a more cohesive story. Does the Midgar portion of this remake need to be 40 hours long? What does that even leave the next chapter with? And will Nomura be able to screw it up somehow? I don't know, but at least there's one thing that I can say. It was way better than Final Fantasy XV. It's just... a house. Buckle up, everyone. This is gonna be quite a doozy. Oh boy. I remember when Neil Druckmann from Naughty Dog had an interview with Kotaku when he said that unlike the original game's theme of love, as in how much you would go to save the one you care about most, the sequel is going to focus around the theme of hatred. And from that moment, I knew this game is going to upset me quite a bit. And there are many story points that I'm not gonna spoil that definitely upset me, but honestly, I rather commend Rockman and his team for the gall they had to push boundaries when it comes to storytelling in video games. Even if the feeling I got caused my stomach to churn, it caused a reaction, and I like to be challenged when I play a game. And I really have to commend the cast for the outstanding job, especially Laura Bailey who did not deserve the backlash she got because the way she portrayed Abby is nothing short of stellar. Naughty Dog managed to elevate its greedy stealth gameplay. The enemy AI is second to none, as they flank you from all directions and even dogs can pick up your scent immediately and catch you off guard. Using the expensive environment to catch an enemy off guard was incredibly satisfying. And of course, it's perhaps the most graphically impressive game that ever came out on the PlayStation 4. I'm not only talking about the beautiful grassy decaying open areas, but the individual desolate apartments are so detailed it's easy to start theorizing what did people do before the outbreak started. So, with all that said and done, why can I place this game any higher than this spot? Honestly, this experience might have been a bit too harrowing for me. This isn't a short game, and the melancholy does not let up throughout its 25 hour runtime. The lack of any levity or some semblance of an emotion that isn't distilled hatred made this a very unpleasant experience. And I know, it's by design, but this didn't happen to me with the original game. Ellie in particular added a lot of fun and snark to contrast the rather depressing narrative, which is why as a player you wanted to root for Hera and Joel to survive. And I don't mind that Ellie changed since the first game, that's perfectly understandable, but none of the other characters really balance her new perspective on life, which makes playing her kind of a chore. 
Wow, I think this might have been the longest I've ever spent on a single entry in my top 10s. And ironically, this isn't even my number one. But I will say this for a game about death, it's amazing how it made me appreciate on how fleeting life can be. And in a year like 2020, that's definitely an achievement. Sometimes a game comes around that I have no idea how to classify, and Bugsnax is definitely one of the most imaginative games I have played in years. It's very akin to being a nature explorer on TV and finding those unique creatures that you learn more about throughout your adventure. Capturing those elusive creatures is a puzzle of its own since there are so many unique gadgets that players can use to obtain them. But the true surprise for me was perhaps my favorite story I've played throughout the entire year. I never expected a game featuring a character like Chandlo Funk Bun to make me care as much as I did. No matter how outlandish the premise is, the interpersonal relationship felt endearing and real that they grounded the whole experience. The writing and acting are so great to the point I wanted to do every single side quest just so I can learn more about the denizens of Snacktooth Island. Honestly, I would like to tell you so much more about Bug Snacks, but it's a game you definitely want to experience to yourself because there is so much more beneath the surface. This is a journey you definitely want to embark on. And it also gets extra points for Bunger. Bunger? Bunger, 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 Bunger. It's good back! Bunger, Bunger, Bunger. You know what? That does it. In this video, I'm going to coin a new term. If there is a game that comes out that I absolutely adore and no one else talks about, I'm gonna say it got Neo'd. And you know why? Because Neo 2 is as spectacular as its predecessor. It's by far the best Souls game not to be made by From Software. Just the fact that there are so many weapons and there's three stanzas to each and a plethora of different attacks that can be used make it one of the deepest games for action fans to play. And on top of that, it adds some really helpful mechanics that will help some of those who struggle with the first one. While the demon forms that were introduced in this game were pretty cool looking, their main function is to use the burst counter. Unlockable attacks in Souls games can be pretty devastating one-hit kills, but using burst counter at the right moment to nullify the attack is some of the most satisfying gaming moments I have had throughout the year. I really don't know what else to say, I've been preaching about this game three years ago with the original and I don't know what else to say about the sequel. Oh, I know! Do you have a PS5? Are you one of those people who really enjoy the Demon's Souls remake? Well, get Neo! Considering that this game and its predecessor recently got remasters for the PS5, you have absolutely no excuse. <laughs> As much as I had fun with the PlayStation 5, I can say the same for the Xbox Series X. It's a great machine, I just wish there were more games for it. But one definitely stood out, and that's Ori and the Will of the Wisps. I finally got a chance to play The Blind Forest, and it was definitely expertly made, but isn't without its flaws, especially the very mediocre combat. Will of the Wisps took the one flaw the original game had and fixed it completely. The combat is really enjoyable, especially with all the different attacks that Ori can use. Enemies are harder to take down, but thanks to the new arsenal, it's far more engaging and not to mention the absolutely terrific bosses. Traversal was also massively improved as Ori gets new abilities like a handy side dash that more than often helped me through tough jumps. It's much more forgiving with an automatic save feature and an upgrade system that feels less rigid and allows players to invest in the abilities they see fit. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention how emotionally moving this game is. 
With very little dialogue, this game managed to make its Walden characters for every sad and crushing moment, there is a cute moment that will actually put a smile on your face too. I am not ashamed to admit, this game made me cry twice, and there are very few pieces of media, let alone games, that caused me to have such a strong reaction. Ori and the Will of the Wisps is as touching as it is masterfully designed, and a game that should absolutely not be missed. Allow me to give you a small history lesson. This right here is Greca7, one of the premier game reviewers of GameSpot in the early 2000s. He left the site around 2007 in order to start his own career in the video game industry until he finally founded his own company, Supergiant Games. And yeah, they made some pretty awesome stuff that I just never had the time to play until now with Hades. Yep, you knew this game is gonna show up on the list, so let's talk how great it is now. Hades is a roguelite game through and through, going from room to room, beating up enemies with a variety of weapons, dying over and over, rinse and repeat. But what makes it stand out in its genre is its story. It's amazing how a game takes a simple premise of escaping Tartarus and weaves it into the mechanic of roguelite games. You can spend hours dying over and over dozens of hours and yet the character dialogue never repeat itself, and more importantly, everything is so well written in voice. Heck, my favorite character might be Hades himself, and besides being a giant unstoppable force, he's usually at his desk dealing with paperwork and berating his son. In addition, the combat and controls in this game are nothing short of sublime. Every maneuver feels precise, and experimenting with all different weapons and buffs make each run unique. Every death I knew was due to my own faults, and I learned through my own mishaps how to become better. To me, it's amazing a game that relies on such a repetitive formula can find ways to surprise and innovate dozens of hours in, even past the initial credit roll. The sheer commitment of Supergiant to imbue so much character into this genre helps Hades transcend above its competitors. And it's one hell of a time. At the tail end of March, when this whole pandemic started, there was this one game that came out of the perfect dime that I needed during quarantine. A game I can just immerse myself in and not have any care in the world. And that game... is Doom Eternal. Doom Eternal takes everything that worked in Doom 2016 and makes it better. It's one of those games that I never dread going to a room full of enemies. In fact, I'm filled with glee. Because man, all the creative ways you can kill demons in this game is just staggering. Each weapon has two mods that players can experiment with, grenades that can freeze enemies, a chainsaw that can help you replenish ammo, and of course the glory kills that no matter how many times I do them, they never ever get all. Ever. And I really enjoyed the platforming too, and I know it's kind of a hot take to platform in a first person shooter. But thanks to the myriad of moves the Doom guy has, like climbing on walls or swinging on monkey bars, it was incredibly fun. Not to mention all the cool secrets that can be found thanks to those techniques. Speaking of opinions I'm clearly the minority at, I like the fact I'm not just in Hell or in Mars, and I get to explore different kind of planets and areas. I am the person who grew up with platformers, so I'm used to going from Grasswold to Icefold, so I like the visual change in scenery. And speaking of things that appeal to me, that's really the reason why Doom Eternal is so high. I just have this arcade sensibility when it comes to gaming. I don't like to be bombarded by story or just slog through lots of prologue material 
I just want to press start and go. Even though the story moments in Doom Eternal did make me chuckle here and there. And you know what? If that's the kind of game you like, I cannot recommend this game enough. Give Doom Eternal a chance. You won't regret it. For all the years in which both Insomniac and Naughty Dog got all the acclaims, it's really refreshing when Sucker Punch goes away with the gold medal. Ghost of Tsushima is one fantastic video game. This wonderful homage to Japanese cinema captivated me from the very beginning. This war sequence alone when you ride on your horse, you noticing the flaming arrows in the sky, finding hordes of Mongolians. Oh my god, it's so well executed. I was lucky enough to play this game for the first time on the PlayStation 5, and man, that 60 FPS boost makes the action appear so much more fluid. And heck, even not on PlayStation 5, those visuals are absolutely stunning! From every corner of Tsushima Island, just seeing how the grass sways and all different particle effects like rain or snow, Sucker Punch outdone themselves. This is some of the best graphics on the system. An element of the game I don't see celebrated often is the story, as I personally really enjoy the tale of Jin Sakai, a samurai that's been struggling to keep his honorable code versus doing whatever it takes to save the land. As beautiful as this game is, it doesn't shy from the horrors of war, and you can see it throughout the entire story meeting all the different side characters. Special shout out to Lady Masako, who is pretty much the most badass older lady in video game history. Combat is visceral and dynamic. Despite a lack of a dedicated lock-on feature, it's simple to aim at a specific enemy and switch around sword stances in order to deal with the right weapon. And if you're opposed to the red confrontation, being a stealthy ninja is just as fulfilling, especially impaling a poor Mongolian with a sword. But the main reason why this game is number one is a little bit more personal. At a certain point, I had to send my PlayStation 5 for repair, and when I got it back, I found out that my save file for Ghost of Tsushima was not backed up, so 18 hours of progress were completely lost. So what did I do? I just hopped back onto the saddle. The experience meant so much to me that I didn't care that I had to grind the first act again. And in a year where escapism was incredibly necessary, to drown myself from all the terrible things that happen in the world, Ghost of Tsushima gave me the joy I needed, and that is exactly why it's my number one game from 2020. Thank you all for watching. <laughs>